Welcome again to the uh, monthly CX seminars. Welcome in Tucson and welcome out there in Ethernet. Uh, today we have two very special speakers with uh, apparently different approaches to agriculture and crop growing, but with the same theme in mind, and that is that because of climate change, because of reduced rainfall, because of increasing temperatures, decrease in arable lands, increase in population, all of these mitigating circumstances require all of us who are involved in producing food uh, to do it more effectively, to do it with less uh, resources, and by that I mean natural resources, not necessarily money. Um, and so our speakers today are going to talk about two quite different areas of uh, doing these, this kind of work. One in open field, the other one in controlled environment. And I'm particularly glad that Pedro Andrade has joined us from the Maricopa uh, agricultural station, which is part of the U of A, uh, because his emphasis is on optimizing crop production in open fields, which is where most of the crops still come from. And the second speaker, Murat Kachir from the SIAC, is going to be talking about pretty much similar approaches, but in controlled environments. So Pedro, thank you for coming. And we all are going to watch very intently the machine that you're working with because it's a huge, huge machine. Uh, I've never seen it in person, but you can see it on the picture. And um, it's uh, one of a kind, isn't it? Pretty much? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, thank you, everyone. It's, it's okay. I speak this way. You guys can hear me well in the back. Good. So, a um, couple of comments before I get into the material that I have prepared for you. And one is that my goal coming here presenting this seminar was to show you a broad picture of what is it that we do in in you um, know with with our approach to collect data with with uh, electronic systems. Okay, I wouldn't. I don't have enough time to go into a whole lot of detail in, in any of the two approaches that I'm showing to you today, okay? Because there's not enough time. But if if I if, if we finish today, and you guys have a good idea what is it that we're doing in Maricopa, then I I I, I did my job. I, I I completed my objective, okay? So and I will stay for the rest of the of the of the of the event. And there's questions or things to be to be. Um, that we need to talk more, I'll, I'll be glad to. So just keep in mind, uh, general in a, in a way, but I want to give you enough of, of, uh, of, the, of the flavor so you, you can see what it is that we do in Maricopa. The other comment that I have is um, I, I'm an ag engineer, and um, just like, like Murad, we tend to focus on a particular area, but I do not have in any way uh, any, any um, in, limits to the work that we do. It just happened to be one in, engaged in field operations. Murat happens to be engaged in controlled environment. We work together, okay? So please don't see this as, as two, two different approaches. It's, it's just two different settings, but the UVA is, is heavily engaged in, in both of them, okay? So uh, with that, I, I'll get started. I will say one more thing, actually. Um, there is an overall theme in my talk, and that is the use of digital inputs uh, for our research, okay? So I'll make special emphasis on what it is that has a digital footprint and how we're using that in our, in our work. Uh, sure enough, this is not. Okay, so um, just to keep in mind, what is what is uh, the material that I prepared uh, for you? 
I felt the need to prepare some introductory material, okay, knowing that this is a, an audience that I'm not familiar with. Uh, and then uh, I want to make sure that, that, we, that I provide enough of the background and historical perspective so you see where I stand on my work uh, that I'm currently doing in Maricopa. So it's just an introduction with some uh, historical elements. Then uh, the main topic of my talk will be on points two and three. Okay? So we are very active with ground platforms, what we call the tractor-based uh, platform. So it's so important, and we are doing um, very good work with that. So I, I, I thought it's relevant that I present to you some of that material. Okay? And Rafi was making reference to number three, the fuel scanner. Okay, so bear with me, I'll, I'll, I'll get you enough information, uh, but I want you to have, again, a broad view of our work in, in, um, in Maricopa. What we're doing, and you'll see this very clearly in, in point one, and, and point, one, point one, very much connected with precision ag, with production, what we call crop management. Okay, from the fertility perspective, from the uh, crop protection pr perspective as well. Um, and then points two and three are very heavy on crop improvement, okay, and, and using phenotyping for crop selection, okay. So our methods are tuned for, those, for many different objectives. I just mentioned two, the two worlds, the, uh, the farm production, and the crop improvement, crop genetics world. Um, Leo Bos is a, it's an, it's an ag engineer too, working for Case IH, and he provided these this, uh, first slides for me. And his point on, on, this, on these slides is about how much incapacity has increased over time. Okay, I, I used to, I remember, using this, this kind of old tractors, you know, we call them old, and these, these kind of controllers that had no, I mean, there were some electronics in them, but they were absolutely not connected to any, any GPS system whatsoever. Uh, but that was at the beginning of the transition into, into the use of more uh, electronic inputs, 1990s. And then by, you, by the 2000s, something really, really important happened in, um, in, in, in this country, and that was the removal of selective availability of GPS. That was a, um, a decree by, by um, a presidential decree, and then from one day to the next, we had GPS to the accuracy that we can then use it in, in farm operations. And that was an explosion of applications since then, since the year 2000. Okay, so what we see now is a lot of uh, auto steer, uh, machine guidance systems and variable rate application, the, the site-specific management of inputs. Okay, Leo's point is that that increased machine capacity. Uh, it did. And what I want you to see is that increased also the digital footprint of agriculture. Now more close to what we are now, where we're heading, uh, there's a lot of uh, work in decision support systems and um, wireless communications, autonomous vehicles, all those kinds of things are being generated. Okay? That's where we're heading. Higher and higher digital input in those operations. So one other way that I that I thought about showing this point to you in a quick way is this is a tractor from the 1960s, 1970s. Some of you may maybe even worked with these type of tractors. It's completely mechanical. There's nothing electric, nothing electronic in those units. This is a fairly new tractor, or it's, it's the intention to get a um, tractor. What's what's what will be a new tractor today? And the the electronic components on this tractor is just very very uh, complex, actually. So how complex they are? These piece appear in, in uh, several outlets last week. Uh, says why American farmers are hacking their own tractors. So it just they're computer control uh, uh, machines. Okay, so it's now the time when when um, it's no longer 
capable of just working mechanically with your tractor. It's all computer control, okay? All, all software uh, control. So it is, it is that time, again, increased capacity. We have these machines that do much more work. They deliver more, more work in the field, but they're built to be, to operate at faster speeds with higher capacity. It's, it's really great improvements, okay? But there is much more digital inputs now, okay? So moving on, <coughs> I got a couple of slides from John Fulton out of Ohio State, and he made, he made some cal calculations that what it is today in terms of using um, prescription files and, and aspects of management that, that require, um, that require the, the management of, of, of software. So he, he comes to um, files that are created um, as the operations were, were made, spraying, um, planting. All those operations are actually based on instructions that are written and then loaded to the tractor. Okay, so those instructions are in the tractor computer system and, and then the tractor just goes and plants and sprays and does everything that's needed for, for crop management. Very, very heavy on, on fertility. So we have about five kilobyte, kilobyte of data per plant of corn. That's his estimation. So just keep in mind, a few years ago, it was nothing. It was zero uh, data as an input for production. Now we're seeing that very clearly and we can quantify it. Now, uh, what's more even closer to, to uh, our current times is the use of imaging for, for crop management. So in this case, John computes that uh, based on a, on a resolution of two centimeters per pixel and this frequency of flights, we can then basically increase 10 times that footprint of uh, digital inputs in our production systems, okay? And that's now pretty much happening. We're still, I still think that is, we're in the transition for that to become more day-to-day um, -day operations. But it's certainly, we, we have passed a point where we are applying this, this uh, platforms, UAV platforms to farm production. And it is very powerful, let me tell you, with, uh, with a few snapshots and some software integration, we can have this, these maps created, uh, lots of information that we can use to improve management. What's okay. RGB? RGB stands for uh, red, green, and blue. It, it's one way to say a picture, like the picture you take with your phone. That's an RGB picture. And lots of information can be extracted just out of that picture. Okay, so uh, let's move on now a little bit into, into the material for today, okay? Now I'm gonna present to you what's that approach of using a tractor or a mechanical platform that has uh, an engine and we can, uh, it's a self-propel unit, and we can use it to, to collect data in the field, okay? So we have dedicated a fair amount of effort to develop these systems. The, the machine itself, it's, um, it's, it's a commercial unit. We adapted to uh, this unit to, to, the, um, to the data acquisition system that I will describe in a moment. So um, it is um, forward placement of the sensors. That's an important element in our work because when we do this, we don't disturb the plants by the, by the machine. We first collect the data and then the rest of the machine goes. Um, and something I like uh, very much is that we have no limitations on, on payload, like a UAV. It's limited in how much, um, uh, what's the weight of those cameras that you can carry. In, in this system, we can have lots of weight and, and instruments mounted and payload is not a limitation. We adjust uh, height and clearance of the vehicle. And by far something that's, that's very, very convenient is the use of uh, agricultural tooling. So then we can um, 
move our, move our sensors, move our systems to fit the applications of different crops. Okay? That's something that I, I'm very keen on developing systems that can be used in a variety of applications. Okay? So having the ability to move uh, system, the, 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 uh, the equipment, it's critical. With this, uh, there's, I will describe three different sensors that, that we use uh, quite often. And one is the sensors to capture the, the canopy thermal response, so the temperature of the, the leaves. Okay, in this case, we have these um, thermal uh, infrared units that, in this case, we're using one that is in a nadir position and one that is at an angle. Okay, that's one method that we use to control for, for um, soil background um, interference. So we captured uh, the thermal information. We also captured the light reflectance with active light uh, sensors. Like in this case, it's pointing to this, this unit in, the, in this circle. Uh, these are units that have their own light source. So they're shining light in a modulated uh, pattern, and it registers how much of that light bounces back, and it's, and it's recorded. Okay, only that portion of the light that is that has the same modulation. <clears throat> it's a different network. It's a different um, communications protocol. But in the end, we combine all these sensors and capture the data in the in a single, in, in the same, in a in a common uh, data acquisition platform, which is a Campbell Scientific. Yeah. Uh, we use also sonar transducers to determine the height of the plants, okay? So in the case of cotton, which is the crop that you see there, these sonar transducers are really good. They, they give us a very strong signal. Uh, other crops are not that good, like wheat. We have a lot of problems to have a, a good signal when it, when it comes to wheat, okay? But the, um, again, I'm showing you in gen very general way what that we do, um, what I want you to see is a mechanical platform goes up and down the field and is collecting lots of data on different responses of the crop. The thermal response, the spectral response, and one dimension uh, displacement for, uh, to give us a, an idea of the size of the plant. We do that as the machine is moving. Uh, in my work, I use GPS extensively for many different applications. So we couple all these sensors um, with GPS strings, okay? So when we, when we do our analysis, we have every, every signal and its corresponding position. Notice that we have only one GPS, but we have multiple rows. So some offsets are applied to the data set once it, the job is completed. So the point is, everything is, everything is um, incorporated, integrated in the same platform. This paper, for those of you who are interested in, in knowing more about this particular detail, uh, this paper describes all that information with a lot of detail. But here's a, a performance evaluation from a digital standpoint. We can cover, well, first, uh, field capacity. We can cover close to one acre, one, one hectare of land. Um, in an hour. That happened to be very important. We call this high throughput phenotyping. So if we are going to use this type of platform and if we are capturing thermal response, we want that thermal condition to be relatively uniform or stable during that period of time. Okay, so if we're going to use it for research purposes, we got to be able to do it fast. So about an egg, about one one hectare of land per hour, it's 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 a good good performance, good 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 level. Um, we generate about two hundred uh, two hundred fifty eight bytes per per square meter every time that the machine is moving, okay, and and we can do several events per day. Okay, uh, one 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 example with this uh, sensor-based system with a, with a mechanical platform. 
there is this case where we measure the canopy temperature of cotton. This is a, a, a very a big experiment with hundreds of different varieties of uh, cotton, both, uh, both Pima and Aplam cotton. And notice a few things here. You see all the, all the differences in blue and, and, and greener uh, uh, going by these, these, uh, these sections. Well, the blue ones are colder. Um, they're showing a colder condition, right? It, it's the lower temperature. Whereas this green, yellow tend to be in the high side of the, um, uh, of the temperature range. Okay, so these were treatments. Um, notice also in August 12, 2011, we have at this particular time in the day close to 40 degrees uh, Celsius uh, ambient temperature. But we have plants that can be 10 degrees lower than that ambient temperature and 20 degrees higher than that ambient temperature. That's something very unique about our low desert that allow us to do these heat and drought uh, studies. And we're exploiting that in this, in this type of research. Okay, so with this, with this uh, context, the platform goes, collects the data, it's processed, uh, georeferenced process, and then statistics by plot level are, are, are determined. Okay, so I'll leave that ground platform for a moment, and I'm going to then talk about this, this aspect of the, uh, the, the field scanner in Maricopa which was one of the main points that, that Rafi uh, introduced. So there are so many things that are different in this case. I'll, I'll, I'll make an effort to, to point to all those as, as, as I go in the rest of my slides. Uh, but one thing I, w I, want, I want you to be very clear, and this is an imaging system. Okay? I presented to you this mechanical platform with sensors. And we had the ability to go faster to collect data because those are just uh, electronic signals that we can then uh, capture faster. But when it comes to images, it's a different throughput. Okay, so keep that in mind. Let me now um, show you some details about this this particular scanner. And let me start with the institutional uh, recognition. How this is coming from first. This is federal funding from the Department of Energy in a, in a program called ARPA-E. ARPA-E is the equivalent of DARPA in the, in the defense uh, environment. Okay, that's the that's, uh, Department of Energy's effort to bring innovation. And it happened to have this program, TerraREF, which is looking at uh, biofuels or aspects of um, fuel stocks from, from uh, biological materials, in this case, uh, sorghum, uh, it's on crops. Okay, so uh, fairly new, ARPA-E was created in 2007. Very good setting to, to have research that it's very um, articulated. So I'll, I'll mention a few things on, on that aspect, but that's, it's, it's, it's a really good source of funding research. So everything that we'll say it's actually here at terraref.org. So if you have any aspect that you want to go a little deeper on this on your own you you have all the access uh, to information on this this site. But this particular slide shows really what's what's at the core of this. We have this field scanner also known to be the world's largest field crop analytics robotic system. Okay, uh, let me say a few things before I forget it. This is the only kind of type of scanner, um, th the only scanner of this type in the United States. Okay, and there's only two in the world. The other one is at uh, the UK in Rothamsted Research. And, and our unit is four times larger than that one in the UK. So, um, but then you have a exceptional computational pipeline for the data analytics work that's done on these on this, uh, data streams. 
um, the uh, the work that is done at at the um, Danforth Plant Science Center on on testing these these genotypes. There's a similar unit which happened to be a a uh, indoor unit that all materials are screened before they're tested in the field. Okay, and there is a group of um, plant breeders that work with, with uh, so energy sorghum. It's Clemson University in Texas A&M, and they provide this, uh, this germplasm that we test in Maricopa. Okay, so that's a lot of information. Again, uh, I don't have the time to, to go much deeper than this, but it's available. Information is available for you if you want to know more. And I still have a few slides and about five minutes to, to finish my talk. So uh, a few things to say on construction. Okay, I always find interesting to share some elements of construction with the audience, regardless of what the technical uh, or discipline there is. Um, find it relevant to, to hear that this is actually 30 tons of steel. And support is on, on uh, 78 concrete pylons, which combined have uh, 50 cubic meters of concrete rebar and everything else. So obviously we're looking at the unit that is not portable in any way. It's there for that particular segment of land. Um, it is this is something unique to our weather uh, climate that we have uh, uh, lining protection for these units. So there's, there's uh, 500 meters of grounding cable below ground, below grade and um, this, you don't see these posts here, but this is a counterpoise system. So in, in the event of a storm, electrical storm, this whole scanner will move to the north and will park underneath those uh, uh, poles. And in the case of a lightning strike, then it is expected to, to hit uh, the cables first and then dissipate in the ground. Electric power, uh, we had to bring power from the grid to be able to, uh, to provide power for the whole system. Uh, and this is really relevant. 72 strand single mode optic fiber. Okay, we, we had a, um, a contract to, to a, a, spe a specification for a particular um, um, type of uh, optic fiber. It happened to be a 24 strand. We had the opportunity to do 72 and they have additional capacity for future expansion. Okay, another note that I also find interesting, and now let's take a look. I often ask, what is the cost of this unit? And uh, the, um, I don't know exactly, but we have a good idea how much it costs, but let me present it to you in, in some way. Uh, this land here, which was, this whole area was nothing different than this, this part portion here. Uh, the value of that land is about 20, five cents per square foot, okay? Nobody will sell you a square foot, uh, but if you do the math, it comes down to be 25 cents, okay? So Pinal County land, 25 cents per square foot. Uh, this is the uh, residential value in Tucson. This is in Phoenix. And this is in blue, this piece of land here, okay? So all of a sudden, from one year to the next, it's $180 per square foot. So the point there is that much investment in this facility. We really have to be very smart in how we use it and very intense in bringing projects so that we, 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 uh, we recover some of that, some of that investment. <clears throat> okay, so field scanner. It's been operational about from, from, from the last 12 months only. So it's fairly new still, and we're still troubleshooting a lot of the components. I should say that. You see this uh, aerial picture. Uh, so this is the scanner, and down here is this sensor box, okay? So this is where all the imaging systems reside. Hyperspectral, stereo, uh, FLIR. FLIR is um, the thermal uh, camera. 
lasers and photosynthesis to um, <coughs> systems, uh, fluorescence based. So this is one thing that I added today. We, on average, we do about five terabytes of data uh, per day. Okay, we have capacity up to ten. That will be our maximum, given the circuit the, in the contract that we have. Um, this this is set by CenturyLink, but we do about five terabytes of data per day. And this unit moves up and down, sideways, and in all different directions, about 10 kilometers in 24 hours. It's obviously programmed. You just let it go, and, and it does all the, uh, all the work um, day and night automatically. OK, I'll skip this. This is just information on the different uh, angles of field of view, which happen to be a very, very challenging element in this system. <clears throat> so with this, I want to just very briefly describe the, the type of cameras here. Uh, laser scanners, thermal infrared, uh, st stereo, red, green, and blue. Um, this is actually a very near infrared, shortwave infrared, and fluorescence. These are our hyperspectral cameras. With those systems, this is all the, and more, this is only a, a, a list of some of the traits that we can obtain with this scanner. Okay? We can look at phenology architecture in many different, expressing many different forms, and I have one example. So moving on, um, this is also available. Same, uh, and even more information, more detailed information is here. But let's, let's uh, only see for now architecture. Okay, on data, I often, uh, I'm asked, how fast can this scanner move? And really depends on what, what imager is, is active at that point in time, OK? Because obviously, you see here that in this square represented the, the very near, uh, near uh, infrared, it's, it's the one that generates most of the data, OK? So it's the one that's going to move. When we're doing that, it's going to go slower, right? But when there's a thermal, when we're doing thermal imaging, it can go much faster, OK? So we can cover the whole area in about four hours if, we're, if we only are looking at thermal uh, infrared, OK? Uh, this, is, this is just our, our capacity on, on the supercomputer. Um, um, it's, it's, uh, it's the University of Illinois uh, supercomputer system. OK, I want to give you some idea on how much is this. If, if on a regular day, we can do about three or four terabytes of, of uh, data with this, this, uh, this imager, and about one terabyte of the shortwave infrared and other things, lasers, this is, is equivalent to downloading 1,250 encyclopedias, um, the, the, last, the last version of the um, of the um, Britannica Encyclopedia. So it's a lot of data. And we do that every day. OK, this uh, last two slides are created for um, the credit of Robert uh, Pless. So this is when we started looking at how we use this data. And in this case, this is uh, 3D reconstruction with, uh, with red, green, and blue images. OK, it was astonished me the one millimeter accuracy in in, uh, in 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 three directions. So let me try to run this this uh, video. It shows the time lapse. This is all created uh, with with al uh, algorithms that Robert works, and it's the same the same portion of the of the of the field. It's just a scan so many different times. And, and it gets to, to these images. OK, so I'm going to finish there. Um, but I want to bring three um, thoughts, three aspects that I, I, I want to make sure that those are understood. I'm five minutes over my time. Uh, the first one is about digital ag is advancing a fast rate. It's no, no other direction that we're heading uh, uh, currently. And we use that for crop protection and curriculum management. 
So we are active in that area. All the information that we collect, it gives us ideas, ideas on how we can improve crop management, mainly using sensors. Uh, when we use ground and U of A platforms, um, we provide a system that is portable. We can take it to different locations, and that, that's a tremendous help in our program, the ability to take it to different fields. Uh, and it's a low cost or lower cost than what it is, the, the high-end imaging system. Um, very clear, the gantry is a reference system. It's not meant to be replicated everywhere in the United States. We can then test and, and have an, an open access to, for research. And, and uh, that's the reason why we, we, we're doing the highest resolution possible. And that's the objective of Terra, to have these data sets available for other uh, groups. And system complexities are very challenging. We're still, uh, we're still troubleshooting many of the things in this system. But we're collecting data, and we're, we're making good progress. So I'll stop there. Um, again, I'm, I will stay around for, for the rest of the event, and, and I can talk to some of you that may have questions at the end. Or there's question and answers later on. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You know, I can. Uh, it's really amazing. I was up to six years old. We had horses. You come a long way, Pedro. Uh, Pedro, one of the things that I find very important, and we do this in greenhouse, but I think application in open field, and you could probably do this, and that's vapor pressure deficit measuring, you know, humidity, temperature as to when the plant is very active. And we know uh, that the more hours per week, it has a reflection on yield, especially for crops multi-harvest. So for, for us, uh, I do a lot of work in California with open field with the, in Salinas. It would be very interesting if you're not, if you could add that to all your other sensors, or you probably have those sensors now, you could put it into a graph. So that would be fantastic. Pedro, you may want to use this. Um, any other questions? Yes, come in, Jack. Excellent presentations. There are a couple of points that come up. One is that you put the emphasis on phenotype, but the integration of genotype, phenotype, and the environment in which plants grow. If you were explaining this to a congressional panel, as far as how is this helping our America. It's obvious that you're saving water, there are a number of other things, but to the consumer, where is there a better type of cotton or a better type of food or better product that's coming in as the end product of what you're doing? And the other component to this is when you've looked at the photosynthesis side of things, you have the big data here that I think you could extract out where you're converting CO2 to oxygen. And that would be very meaningful for the public to understand. Okay, very briefly, yeah, we call these studies uh, G by E experiments. So it's the genetics in, uh, in the environment that we test them. So it's, it, that's the emphasis of our work, to test to test um, this, this germplasm in the environment that they will be growing eventually. And where I come in these projects is I provide expertise on the instrumentation and uh, the systems to, to make these experiments uh, flexible and, and make them uh, um, the data collection to, to have the quality of information that we need. Uh, but then there is a, a large group of people whose expertise is in, in, in um, plant breeding and crop physiology, and they are better suited to the selection process, and the, eventually what they're after is gene discovery. Okay? And that's well beyond me. I, I'm, I'm an engineer that provides this, this, this background uh, to, to accelerate these this, uh, selection processes. But in the end, it's, it's, a, it's a joint effort, uh, and many disciplines come in place. And that partially answers that, that question um, that was in the back. 
um, on how we can use especially thermal infrared uh, to characterize that response of the, of the crop to um, um, ambient conditions. Murat, do you want to comment on this? Yeah, I think uh, Pedro responded this really well. So I think now we have uh, um, a lot more capabilities in terms of the technology available. We're you know able to generate huge data uh, data sets that can help improving these uh, uh, breeding processes and coming up with varieties or crops that are more resistant to the environmental challenges. And at the end. Uh, you know there could be you know uh, possibilities to have crops or varieties that uses resources less and we would not pollute the environment uh, so everything that we discuss here at the end is kind of targeting the consumer the environment and the resources that we have so I think that's a very um, important point that you made Jack Another point comes up in regard to the algae side, and often we see things on the news in regard to a contamination of a river or a contamination even in the Gulf of, uh, well, Mexico with, with a oil spill and the other types of contamination, and algae is often looked at as the bad guy. Now, how do we go ahead and engineer and utilize sensors and utilize better technologies to harvest that which we see as contaminant algae and convert that into something worthwhile. That's, yes, that's a new uh, area, a new challenge, yes. Uh, uh, but yes, so the, 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 uh, there, were, there are actually satellite-based imagery to kind of detect algae, you know, uh, in the contamination or algae uh, growth in, in oceans and rivers and to kind of look at management uh, alternatives to, to kind of mitigate that. So, um, but you're right, you know, the detection capabilities, the technology has been there and it's already advancing, but trying to decide in terms of what to do with that and then convert that into a usable uh, product is, is, I think, is evolving as, as we speak. So uh, that, that's, um, that's important too, I think, yeah. Okay, um, I'm gonna, we've got a lot of good positive comments from mm -hmm. out in the ethernet. Um, people say it was a very interesting talk. And here's a question, any device to know the MRL in fresh produce without sending produce samples to a laboratory? Can you can you help me? Repeat that question to the group so that we have a good sense of what he's trying to get at. Is there any sensor out there to detect the MRL uh, before sending the sample to the lab? So if uh, our uh, 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 if they can elaborate on that, uh, yeah. If, if, uh, do anyone uh, of you know what the MRL? We, need, we I guess we need some elaboration on that question, uh, and I'll. Let's see. Okay, um, and he means pesticide pesticide residues in fresh produce. Um, that's 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 a ch that's uh, you know uh, the, the hyperspectral imaging has been used to look at cont contam contamination or pesticide residues on on produce, uh, but uh, the challenge is to really differentiate that chemical. Uh, contamination uh, and the the constituent in that chemical contamination. So um, uh, I I am not sure at this point to tell that if there's a specific application that is capable of telling a a, a certain chemical contamination is detected from a produce. But the technology again is there. I think through uh, through uh, Imaging and some uh, uh, probably machine learning is a possibility. I, I I believe, but I'm not aware of uh, any direct sensor that is out there at the moment to to do that. Yeah. Well, just quickly, I want to I want to make a comment on, on that side. Is is that we made very good progress in, in compositional analysis and, and sensor-based um, uh, approaches.
but to detect a contaminant, it takes uh, uh, to to a to a, a different level, and it's it's really not 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 absolutely. So uh, I will say this: we have technology to to look at the response of the plant to abiotic stress, abiotic stress. Very good. I will say we we we've done good progress. Compositional, uh, some also uh, I think is is improving. But that area is, is, is hard. OK. Um, and let's see what we have here. Talk to the challenges of off-grid CEA, a most viable use case. Uh, clarifying the acronym so everybody knows what the letters are standing. The, the off-grid. Uh, CEA is what we mean is that a the controlled environment uh, food production system that is off the grid, not connected to the, the, the to the grid providing the energy and the power. So with that, as I mentioned, you know there are some possibilities and applications. Um, for instance, remote locations where uh, people may not have direct or immediate access to the power or a steady energy uh, or a power in that location. There are locations around the world, especially in developing countries, even the power is available, it is not reliable. Uh, or to bring that energy to that side is, uh, is not cost effective. Um, and I mentioned a couple of other alternative applications uh, that was on the slide. So I would uh, see those as possibilities, but in, in, in developed countries uh, also uh, we can uh, look into strategic integration of uh, uh, photovoltaics with uh, food production systems in greenhouses. Uh, island locations in islands, uh, those would be some, uh, those would be possibilities. Um, it will be at the end to make a decision on the specific crop. There might be some shade tolerant crops because it's really counterintuitive in greenhouses to install a photovoltaic system on the roof of the greenhouse where you really need light transmission into the greenhouse, but there might be crop that could tolerate that. Um, and then that would enable to, uh, re to generate the revenue uh, with that integration rather than just producing the, uh, the crop. As I said, the technology is really is, it is advancing. There are so much, so many possibilities with photovoltaics. So we have to kind of step into and then into doing research to really evaluate this technology to see what are the capabilities as well as the limitations to help the manufacturers of these uh, technologies so we can in the future hopefully find a practical economical application. One more question if there is one. No? Well I want to thank both of you Pedro and Murat for two fantastic presentations bringing us to the edge of development in agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.